It makes up 60% of the human body and 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with it. Scientists have found evidence for it on the moon, in space, and even on Mars. It's one of the most abundant compounds in the known universe. I can never leave a Starbucks without spending at least a sawbuck, a venti, a 20. But there's one thing that's always free, if you ask nicely, and that's a venti cup of water, a venti agua. And it tastes pretty good, as I will now demonstrate. There's actually official water tasters that make their living from reviewing different types of water. But I bet none of them have ever analyzed one of the samples that I'm gonna be taste testing today. Martin, I heard about you and I was fascinated. You are a water sommelier. Correct. And you believe uh, that there are many types of water and flavors of water and that it's important to know the distinction. I'm not even believing in that. I think there is actually, it's a, it's a fact. Ah. Ordinary H2O. Take two hydrogen atoms, atomic number one, on the periodic table, with one proton in the nucleus. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And all you need to do to make your recipe is combine it with element number eight, oxygen, forming a close covalent bond that can be very hard to break. Water is very stable, and all life as we know it requires water for its existence. Life began on Earth in water probably about three and a half to four billion years ago, soon after the Earth formed. The total amount of water on Earth has not really changed much since, although the form in which the water has taken, whether it's solid or liquid or vapor, has changed dramatically over the past billions of years. So where did water on Earth come from? How was it formed in the first place in the universe? And why is there so much of it in the cosmos. It's actually far from rare. It's one of the most common compounds in the entire universe. Now, Earth is the only known planet with liquid surface water located as it is in the so-called habitable zone surrounding its host star, our sun. Some exoplanets could have a trickle or two. On Earth, 97% of our water is in the ocean. Of the remaining 3%, most of that is locked up in ice at the polar caps in the north and south. Over a third of what's left is underground. That leaves just over about 1% of all water on Earth actually usable by humans and other living life forms. Water is pretty unique. It expands when frozen, becoming less dense as it solidifies, rather than more dense like other liquids do when they freeze. Thanks to that, ice that forms in bodies of water floats up to the surface, leaving liquid water underneath. And allows us to ice skate on top, do some ice road trucking, and maybe do a little bit of ice fishing for those denizens of the deep. So water floats when solidified, it becomes less dense on top of ordinary water, as this experiment demonstrates. Now, that's because of the unique polarity of water molecules. An electronegative ion and an electropositive ion come together forming an ionic bond between them. This actually forms the wetness properties of water, which also can create surface tension that allows some animals, or maybe even Jesus, to walk on water. It enables the capillary action that allows water to flow up through the xylem and phloem, if I remember from high school biology properly, inside of trees. It also causes the hexagonal structure of snowflakes and ice crystals. The orderly crystal structure is attributable to the almost 120 degree bond angle between the two hydrogens and the oxygen. Put six of them together and you get a hexagon, but it's not exactly 120 degrees. That's why every snowflake will be randomly different and no two are alike. The crystal structure also pushes the ice molecules apart, which is why water's density decreases as it freezes, shown here. It's time to resume our tasting flight. Next on the level of expensiveness is Fiji water. Fiji water is about four bucks a liter, but it's still a relative bargain, even though it's infinitely more expensive than this free Starbucks water. It allegedly comes from volcanic cisterns on the island of Fiji. Ah. 
can taste those volcanic minerals. The unique structure gives it natural electrolytes and its signature soft, smooth taste. It's not just water, it's Fiji water. This rain has made the same extraordinary journey. From the clouds above Fiji to a sustainable artesian aquifer deep within the earth. It's not just water, it's Fiji water. Next we come to the priciest, easily commercially available water on our tasting flight, Berg water. This water was allegedly trapped in an iceberg for 15,000 years. Some of the iceberg's ice could be as old as a million years. These icebergs calve, they break apart, and are captured and harvested at great risk and great cost to the ice hunters of the Great White North. At the very top of the world, a hot new business is booming in the freezing waters off Newfoundland. I say new, but really it's been 10,000 years in the making. The business is iceberg harvesting and the cold rush is on. Uh, hmm. It's good. But I miss those minerals. In fact, this has almost no minerals. According to the bottle, this water's journey started over 15,000 years ago in the glaciers of western Greenland and has been safely stored in the ice cap protected by the ocean and the hazardous conditions of the Arctic weather. Isolation has made its source totally inaccessible to man. It is not until massive pieces of ice break off into the ocean in the form of icebergs so that they can be harvested melted and bottled under strict quality conditions in order to preserve the water's natural qualities. You might think that's expensive, but this fossil ancient water is a bargain compared to our next taste test contestant on our flight, deuterium oxide, heavy water. What is heavy water? Again, let's go back to water at all. Why is there water here on earth? Where does it all come from? To understand that, we need to understand the story of hydrogen. Numero uno on the periodic table. One proton and one electron. The simplest of all atoms. But it comes in many different flavors. And although ordinary hydrogen that we're familiar with makes up over 75% of the baryonic matter or ordinary matter, matter such as our composition, it's the very essence of what the universe is made of in terms of ordinary matter. It pales in comparison to the amount of dark matter, and we'll come to that later. It came into existence soon after the birth of our universe itself. Now, two hydrogen atoms coming together and with an oxygen atom make up water that we've been discussing. But there's more than one form of hydrogen, and there's more than one form of oxygen. It turns out to get isotopic variations, the number of neutrons changes in the atom, and we've discussed that in previous videos. Deuterium is the heavy older brother, if you will, of hydrogen. It has a proton, but it also has a proton bound to a neutron. That proton bound to a neutron makes the molecule heavier. Now, it doesn't double the mass of it, even though the neutron and the proton are almost the same mass, because the oxygen atom is so much more heavy than either a deuteron, which is what we call a nucleus of deuterium, or a proton, which is what we call the ordinary nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So the oxygen dominates, so actually heavy water is only heavier by about 10 to 12 percent over ordinary water at room temperature and pressure. The name hydrogen itself means water forming, and that's what happens when the very volatile hydrogen is ignited or combined in an oxygen-rich environment. That's what happened, unfortunately, to the Hindenburg, not the Hinden B-E-R-G, but the Hinden B-U-R-G disaster. 100 years ago, back then hydrogen was the miracle molecule everybody thought was useful for lighter than air vehicles. And after that ill-fated inflation balloon event, we no longer use it for that purpose. Now, most of the water on Earth is in the form of ordinary hydrogen, single proton, and no neutrons. So most of this water on this table has a preponderance, many, many times more ordinary hydrogen than deuterium. But if you can isolate the deuterium, you can actually get a form of water here that's 99.8% deuterium in the nucleus, not ordinary hydrogen. In other words, this has an extra neutron for 998 of every 1,000 water molecules in this bottle. Water, this heavy water, is actually 
lighter even than the heaviest form of water, which is composed of tritium nuclei. Tritium has three nucleons in its nucleus. It has a proton and it has two neutrons. So it has three atomic number units in each nucleus. That's why it's called tritium. Deuterium is lighter. And actually deuterium, the element, was discovered by the namesake of the UCSD chemistry department, Harold Urey, who won a Nobel Prize and actually worked on simulating the conditions of the early Earth in an attempt to understand the origin of life. So there's an intimate connection between where we are right now, the chemistry department at UC San Diego, and the search for life in the universe and how it actually came to form. And perhaps the key could involve some of the processes that made this water. But in addition to being useful to form life, it can also slake my thirst here on a hot San Diego morning. Let's try it. Even more expensive than iceberg water. This is about $200 worth of water, so I should, really shouldn't be uh, dropping it. Deuterium oxide, what they use it for. Printed on the side. Now, getting tritiated water or tritium water would be a much, much more challenging and dangerous occupation. Tritium is radioactive. It gives off uh, high energy radiation, which can damage the human body. So it's a controlled substance, which can be obtained at great cost and risk if you have the proper credentials, which I do not. So let's do a taste test. Down the hatch, deuterium water. Ah, can taste those neutrons. Heavy water, or D2O, cost about a dollar per milliliter, making this single ice cube cost over $25. Now, we're gonna see if it'll float and cool off a drink just as well as an ordinary liquid H2O ice cube does. Let's put it in this petri dish filled with ordinary deionized water. It sinks basically right to the bottom. Here's ordinary water with an ordinary ice cube over here, made for less than one penny. That floats very nicely. This one is stuck to the bottom of the tray. So D2O, or heavy water, when it's frozen, is more dense than ordinary H2O, meaning that it would sink to the bottom of a pond or body of water, whereas ordinary H2O floats on top which is why you can ice skate on top of a frozen water, ordinary water, H2O lake in the winter time. But you couldn't do that on a planet that only had deuterium oxide or heavy water. It's rare, expensive, and extremely useful. Besides its weight, heavy water is less active than regular water, meaning it's harder to melt or to boil. Plus it doesn't have any strong spectral signature. So it's often used for doing uh, nuclear magnetic resonance or NMRI experiments and for diagnostic purposes for human beings and other living creatures. You could actually see the presence of deuterium in space and it was measured decades ago and found later to have agreement with the cosmic microwave background radiation that I study. So where does all the water come from? Well, astronomers think that water is formed in nebulae. We can actually see the presence of water in space. In areas of other molecules, hydrogen can cool off after the cosmic dark ages ended, and eventually oxygen from the formation of the very first stars, so-called population three, those stars that blew up eventually will come together and become bonded in water molecules in space. But space is very cold, so all that molecular uh, water is in the form of ice crystals. Even Saturn's rings are primarily composed of, of ice cubes, not of liquid water, certainly. Hydrogen is the fuel of stars. Through a process called the PP or proton-proton chain, hydrogen fusion takes place and helium is created, releasing prodigious amounts of energy. Helium, named after the Greek god of the sun, Helios, was discovered not on Earth, but on the sun. And how did astronomers discover this element crucial to the universe's structure? Well, they went at night. Helium, number two on the periodic table, takes over and then it fuses itself uh, in helium and makes heavier and heavier elements. Through a process that was first detailed by my late great colleagues here at UC San Diego, Margaret and Jeff Burbage, along with their colleagues Willie Fowler and Sir Fred Hoyle. So helium, through the process they helped to reveal, along with other scientists, forms oxygen which combines with the hydrogen to form water. As stars age, they eventually run out of that hydrogen fuel. But don't worry, the sun, even at the rate of burning 600 million tons a second, the sun has about 4 billion good years left in it. 
Eventually, the rate of fusion in the star is overcome by gravity, and the star collapses, forming a supernova. We've talked about that in previous videos. The oxygen produced during the explosion that results from a type 2 supernova then eventually combines with hydrogen, forming water molecules again in space. The biggest clusters of interactions happen when a lot of tiny molecules are bunched together and they form what are called nebulae, which is Latin for cloud. The same nebulae that birth stars also have water molecules in them, and they also have heavier elements like silicon and uh, carbon that the Earth's crust and core uh, and iron, etc., are made up of and eventually planets can form. But there is a lot of leftover material. Some cosmic space schmutz is not formed into planets and is left over. And if it's in the form of water, it's frozen water, it becomes what's known as a comet. Comets have tremendous amounts of liquid water that has been frozen in the fast, cool expanse of space. And that means that there's a tremendous amount of frozen water in an early planetary system. So water eventually got to Earth, scientists believe, through the bombardment of comets hitting the early Earth. And those initial processes were quite violent, and the water in the cometary ice would melt on the surface of the Earth. But then later, Earth froze over, and at different stages in Earth's history, it was a frozen snowball. But later on, the Earth did warm up through a variety of processes, including solar activity and radioactivity in the Earth's crust, eventually being warm enough to sustain liquid water on its surface. Some of that frozen ice has been trapped at the poles. And one of the places that you can access permanently is at the South Pole, if you have special permission. The South Pole differs from the North Pole in that if you drill down through the ice caps at the North Pole, you'll hit the Arctic Ocean. There's no continent underneath it. But in Antarctica, where I've been twice, uh, for several weeks at a time, is underneath the ice cap, 10,000 foot thick cap of ice at the South Pole nearly. If you drill down through that 10,000 foot, very flat, very appropriate for cross-country skiing snow base, you get rock, you get continental rocks. And in fact, there are volcanoes and all sorts of geological formations that are associated with the continent of Antarctica. And that brings us to our most expensive contender on the tasting flight. This is water from Antarctica, from ancient ice. It's hard to calculate how much this water cost. I collected it at the South Pole in one of my visits and stored it in a proper scientific container. I haven't opened it since. It's over 12 years old, plus about a million years sitting on the icy frozen continent. To get to the South Pole requires a ride on a government transport plane. It's reserved by the National Science Foundation for scientists in the United States for scientists, engineers, and tradespeople. Let's try this million-year-old sip of water. <sighs> hmm, not too bad, even if it did cost $50,000. Water is essential to all life as we know it. But as important as water is to life on Earth, we wouldn't even have water if there wasn't another form of matter, even more essential than water. A type of matter that holds the whole universe together. Dark matter. Dark matter is even more rare and difficult to obtain than Antarctic ice water. And if you'd like to learn more about it, click on this video here.